All right, recording has started. Thank you so much. Um, all right, thank you for being here, everybody. We really appreciate it. Um, my name is Natasha Doye, and this workshop is for the application workshop. Um, it's about some more general information so that you guys have some more information before you get started filling out the application. Um, and my pronouns are she and her. I work uh, with the Office of Community and Homeless Services at Snohomish County. Um, I'm going to be managing this grant. Um, and so I'm here to give you guys a little bit more background information. Um, and then my coworker, Debbie, is also here. Debbie, if you'd like to introduce yourself briefly. Yeah. Hi, I'm Debbie Trosvik, she, her pronouns, and I'm the supervisor uh, currently for the Office of Community and Homeless Services. And um, I think everybody is on here who was on here earlier when I asked, um, but I'll, I'll ask again. If anyone hasn't already put their name and the organization that they work for in the chat, we'd really appreciate it. Um, because it makes it easier for us to follow up with you later if you have any questions. So basic agenda, what we're going to be going over today. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background, and then we're going to go into some uh, funding summary, um, county contracting requirements, reporting requirements, application timeline, and then we'll have time for questions um, and additional contact information at the end. If you have any questions during this presentation, please feel free to either unmute and ask a question or put a question in the chat. And um, let's see. Oh, perfect. Um, guess we will get started with a little bit of background information. So one of the things that I wanted to kind of go over with um, y'all is that this uh, funding is specifically for by and for organizations. The funding comes through the Washington State Department of Commerce and the Washington State Department of Commerce defines a by and for organization as an organization that is operated by and for the community they serve. Their primary mission and history is serving a specific community, and they are culturally based, directed, and substantially controlled by individuals from the population they serve. At the core of their programs, the organization embodies the community's central cultural values. These communities may include ethnic and racial minorities, immigrants and refugees, individuals who identify as LGBTQ+, individuals with disabilities or who are deaf, and Native Americans. Um, so this definition is what we're going to be going by, and this is a requirement for this funding. So um, this is something to keep in mind as you think about uh, how this funding will work for your organization. Another definition that I wanted to go over too is what homelessness prevention is. So according to this funding and the services that this funding um, will support, homelessness prevention helps households who are at risk of homelessness to maintain or obtain stable housing and avoid homelessness. So eligible services include housing-focused case management, temporary rent payments, um, and other housing costs such as arrears um, and utilities. Does anyone have any questions about those two definitions um, or about uh, you know, what services would qualify under this homelessness prevention funding? I just have one follow up. Thank you, Natasha. You, you covered it quite well. Um, as Natasha mentioned, th this is a new kind of funding category for us through um, we were receiving these funds through the pass through of the Department um, of Commerce in Washington State. And so as, as Natasha has pointed out, these are definitions for this funding source that are established by commerce. And so if, if anyone has, um, you know, 
questions, we're happy to answer them either in this venue or one on one. And if we have any additional questions or we're not clear, we will go to Commerce to get clarification. Just so you know, we, we haven't added any other additional restrictions or anything like that for these funding. We're using um, what our pass through funding um, funder being the, the state is using. So just to kind of have a clarification on that. Because it's kind of new to us too, I guess is what I'm saying. All right. And then Debbie, are you ready to talk about new contractors? So I'm also going to um, add in the chat. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I was on mute. I was talking <laughs> to myself on mute. So that's me. Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. I'm going to put um, the website in the chat box just so that everyone has it available. Great. So sorry. Um, I am having my camera off. I, like I just said to myself um, off screen uh, when I was muted, um, I'm going to um, lead you through some information in uh, the slides in the PowerPoint that kind of go at the higher level of if you were awarded funds with the county, what that might look like and entail and require. We thought that might be important um, since we know we may be seeing um, based on some interactions that Natasha has had leading up to this funding, um, just um, people inquiring about the funding um, earlier and such that um, we realize we may have some new organizations that haven't previously contracted with us at the Department um, of Human Services in the county. And so we thought it might be really beneficial to kind of go over at the high level of contracting requirements so that you knew maybe ahead of time what you're getting yourself into if you were awarded these funds. So this first slide talks about um, if you're a new contractor. So if you haven't um, currently um, contracted with the county, let's say in the last couple of years, um, I think it depends on how long there's been a break, um, that um, there's some things that we require um, for from new agencies. And um, we require that all new agencies or contractors have what is called a basic terms and conditions contract with us, as well as a business associates agreement. And um, both of those have the highest level of requirements that the county requires, regardless of the fund source. So for instance, if you um, uh, have like 10 different contracts with us, you would only have one um, basic terms and conditions agreement and only one um, business associates agreement. So we, we as the county only um, have one of each of those with each organization, and that covers um, a majority of information that's required for contracting, regardless of which division you have a contract with in our department, which funding source or which whatever project is. So you only need to have um, one of these, and they're good for multiple years. So for instance, um, many of our current subcontractors signed this agreement back in 2018, and it's still valid. So you only do it once um, every so many years. Um, the county redoes it every once in a while, and then everyone has to redo it. And you only have to have it done once. And um, if this is the case, if you were awarded funding, um, we would work with you to um, to have you receive these agreements and, and get them executed. We are going to work on getting templates of those documents on our website so you can actually go through and review it. I, we can't, we don't have enough time. It's a big document <laughs> to do it in this training, but we're gonna um, uh, share some templates of what those documents entail so that you have a better idea um, of what you're getting yourself into, so to speak. So I think the next slide. Okay, so what this kind of gives a little bit more detail, I'm going to discuss the basic terms and conditions. It is what is referenced into all of our contracts. Um, it um, And it must be executed before we get in a contract with you. The business associate agreement 
also ensures that we have all the requirements for HIPAA covered. So um, start, um, any contracts after 2018, we have to have um, this business um, associate agreement with you. And again, this must be um, executed before we contract with you. I'm kind of have my own slides and notes up, so I can't see if there's uh, questions. So if there's questions, just unmute yourself and ask them. Don't raise your hand or don't be too polite. You might get missed. Um, next slide. Sorry, trying to my um. I think I got a, I think I got a little ahead of myself, and I explained that already. Um, again, any questions on that? I apologize. It's this is a little wonky. I'm not in my normal office today, unfortunately, so my computer's not working as I had hoped. So we're going to switch over. Another basic requirement for contracting with the county is insurance. Um, in the basic terms and conditions, it describes the minimum insurance that we require, um, the county requires for all our subcontractors. This is actually established by Snohomish County Risk Management. Um, they are the ones that um, review the content of the insurance in the indemnification sections um, for a new contract and look at the um, Look at the certificate of insurance prior to our contracts execution. So again, this you don't need to have an insurance policy for every single contract you have with the county. You must have one, and it must be valid and meet the requirements from our risk management section um, department prior to us contracting with you. So. Um, this is also something that we would go over, and I don't know all the nitty gritties off the top of my head on all the requirements and um, levels, but it is in our basic terms and conditions. And again, we will be adding this to the website so you can review it. Okay, next slide. Um, another important area is that we must determine that um, so organizations are um, are not um, debarred from uh, providing services in the sorry um, debarred from um, operating and providing services and this is actually a federal requirement. Um, it um, the federal there's a federal uh, award um, site which is called the System for Award Management SAM. And we are required to search that registry for um, any organizations um, that are identified as debarred or suspended by the federal government um, from accessing um, uh, funding. And so uh, that is another step we undertake when we're um, contracting with new subcontractors or even existing sub um, contractors. Um, we actually have to check SAM regularly anytime we do a new contract or a contract amendment with any funder or, or any subcontractor, even whether they're new or not, we have to do um, we have to check the SAM website and make sure they're not um, debarred or suspended. Um, so that is another um, level of review that will be undertaken prior to executing a contract. Uh, the next section is, um, this was a pretty basic one, but, you know, it's just good to know what to expect. Um, we also require a signature authorization form. So um, this form indicates who at your organization has the legal authority to sign contracts and also sign invoices and whether there are alternative individuals in your organization who are also authorized to either sign contracts or invoices if the primary signer is unavailable. So um, this is something that gets sent out and um, updated, asked to be updated annually with all our subcontractors, regardless if you're new or not. Um, and those um, signatures are checked against um, the signatures for contracts um, when they're signed, as well as invoicing. And if it doesn't um, 
um, coincide with what's on your signature authorization form, um, the documents will be sent back or we will ask that you submit an updated authorization form so that um, the um, they are aligned with each other. Does that make sense? It's a pretty, um, it, it's not, it, that, that doesn't take a lot of time, but it is something we have to have um, on file before we can contract with you. So, um, so all those requirements that I talked about up till now have been um, co county contract requirements, regardless of your fund source or which program you apply for, or um, what division in our department um, you might be receiving funding for. Now I'm going to go into more um, project level contracting requirements and what it looks like um, with um, the pieces of the contract that are specific to a funding source and a program. And so, for instance, for um, this RFP, it would be for the SDG um, prevention funding. Um, you will have a specific contract and it includes a face sheet which references your BTC, the um, the basic terms and conditions and the BAA. So those two um, higher level um, agreements that you sign with the county are referenced in your specific project contract. And then the project um, level contract also has um, several section. It has an exhibit A, which are the details for the terms and conditions for the funding source. So for instance, for this contract, it includes all the requirements from the Department of Commerce that they include in our grant agreement with them. We pass those on to you as a subcontractor, and that's what Exhibit A is. So Exhibit A, we share that with you when we're, um, we're undertaking contract negotiations, but it's not a document that really can be revised or amended. It's approved by our prosecuting attorney um, as to form with the grant agreement we have with the state. And so we don't really um, historically make changes to exhibit A, it's, it's based on the contract requirements or the grant agreement requirements. Exhibit B is kind of what people might call like the scope of work. So that's the specific on what services we are um, funding you for with these um, with in the contract. So, for instance, on this this funding source, it would be the um, homelessness prevention um, services. So, Exhibit B talks about the requirements that are more specific to this intervention being homelessness prevention. So, for instance, just as an example. Um, the funding source um, systems demonstration grant SDG. So I apologize. I realize I've been using an acronym. Com the, the Department of Commerce funding is systems demonstration grant funding, and we call that SDG as an acronym. We fund many different programs in our community with those funds, and they all have the same exhibit A because it's the same grant agreement we have with commerce. But then depending on um, what we're funding, if we have a contract for a shelter using that fund source, the exhibit B would be very specific to shelter requirements. They must be homeless at entry. Um, they must um, reside no longer than 90 days with, unless there's an exception. They must be provide case management services. The case management files must contain X, Y, Z, things like that. Exhibit B for this um, RFP and these funds will be specific to homelessness prevention. So it will go over, Exhibit B would go over who the target population is, um, what's the eligibility requirements, where are the allowable costs and activities, um, what are the reporting requirements, what are any performance requirements. It will be specific to this program being homelessness prevention. And then the final exhibit that will be part of your contract is the budget, which is Exhibit C. And that will give um, that gives the details on what the funding source is, which in this case is our county our, our <clears throat> commerce um, systems demonstration grant funding. And then it has a line item budget budget of what um, what the funding will be utilized for for your program and breakout narrative details on um, actual costs that you would be billing and staffing, for instance, that you would be billing against this grant. So those are kind of the three main pieces of a contract that you would um, see um, if you were awarded funds under this RFP. So next one is invoicing. 
So invoicing, um, sorry, my, it's really hard. I didn't realize it was going to be so hard being on my um, laptop here. So invoicing, um, uh, so invoicing must be submitted monthly. Um, due to this being new funding sources, um, we, uh, we actually are going to require invoices um, be um, submitted uh, monthly with all the backup documentation. Once, um, if we get to the point where we feel solid about all the eligibility um, requirements and allowable costs um, being um, implemented, um, that might be in more um, less frequently, but for now, um, I think we are asking all of our SDG um, homelessness prevention um, some contractors to submit monthly invoices with backup documentation, um, and um, they must be um, any of those expenses and amounts requested must be consistent with what's in that budget um, exhibit C in the contract. So that's what we would review it against. We would review an invoice coming in. Is it consistent with what um, was in the budget? Is it the same staff? Is it the same um, costs? And then are there um, in um, backup documentation, um, fiscal ledgers, um, actual um, receipts for, um, for cost um, things purchased or timesheets, for example, for agency staff, is all of that included? So kind of transitioning to the second half of this um, slide for backup documentation, um, an agency's general ledger can provide a record or summary of all the financial transactions that occurred um, for that whatever month period you would be billing us for. And um, the general ledger should support what's on the invoice. So those should be, um, um, they should support each other that we should be able to look through it and it should make sense that they're the same cost or the same categories. Um, we also um, require source documentation, and that is evidence that a transaction action actually occurred. So for instance, for supplies or, or goods or services, it would be a utility bill, a phone bill, um, an invoice or a receipt or something like that. And for staff time, it could be a timesheet. Um, also, again, source documentation should match the general ledger if you're also submitting the general ledger. Um, Timesheets have to reflect that the staff person's actual time worked was billed to this grant. So it should have like um, the date of the hours the staff person worked um, and like uh, that they were billing to a certain grant, um, for instance, or if maybe if they're hundred percent that it indicates that on their timesheet that they're billing to this grant or to the program if the program's funded hundred percent by this funding. Um, I'm gonna pause there. I know I'm talking really fast because I don't wanna run out of time either, but any questions on that? Sorry, I should have paused earlier. Okay, I'll keep powering through. You guys let me. Um, so in addition to invoicing, another requirement that we have is reporting requirements. Um, again, uh, these are state funds and they are required um, to, uh, these programs are re required to use homeless management information system. It is a database um, um, that collects um, agency and more specifically client level data. And it's required by our state and federal funding sources. And as I mentioned earlier, Natasha and I mentioned, these are state funds. And so they require that all our homelessness prevention um, programs utilize HMIS. Um, basically, that means your agency would um, uh, become an HMIS user where you would um, uh, collect and input your data and um, be able to report out um, to us through, through HMIS um, who you're serving and how they're being served. Um, HMIS, the Homeless Management Information System, is actually managed and operated by a team within the county. And so um, uh, we would, uh, the county provides you support on that and all the requirements. Um, if you're kind of familiar with HMIS, um, 
uh, it's required nationally, but you're um, allowed to choose your own vendor. And um, Snohomish County uses Client Track as our vendor for the HMIS system. Um, it's a web-based database. And um, uh, like I said, agencies have access to it, um, but um, there's some requirements around security and um, workstation use for that. But um, uh, all, your staff, um, HMIS does not cost anything for you to utilize. Um, the county pays the fees for the licensing. And um, we also train you and provide um, technical support. And um, you can bill the time for your staff to input the data to the grant. Um, it's not like overtly cumbersome. It's, you know, it's basic demographics information for clients when they're enrolled. And then there's some periodic updates to whether, um, for instance, um, increasing their income or perhaps like what their housing stability is when they exit the program. So there's um, the, the largest amount of data you would be reporting in is at intake, enrolling the household in your program and all the members of the household, and then an exit, when they exit the program, what their status was. Um, there's just a few um, interim points that are also required um, in HMIS. Um, so we do have requirements in our contracts about entering the data into HMIS. Um, and Data quality is really important. Um, not only does the county pull the data, but the state of Washington has access to this data. Um, and they look for completeness and timeliness and accuracy and consistency. So we have um, a lot of requirements in our contract regarding um, the requirements of how frequently and how quickly data is entered at the various stage of a client um, being entered into um, this database. Um, there's, uh, there's requirements around informed consent. Um, clients must give informed consent in order to have their personally identified information entered into this database. There's a lot of security within this database, but there also has to be consent from the household. If there isn't consent, there's still data collected, but it's um, de-identified. Um, so let me see. I think that's the last of my reporting. I think we're going to go into the timeline next, but um, I know I, I went over a lot. So I, I asked two things at this point. One, obviously, if you have any questions on anything I covered. Two, if you have questions on something I didn't cover and you, you just want to ask it, or maybe you contracted with the county before and you're confused about something, I can answer that as well. So it's wide open. Hit me with your best shot. I, I'll try to answer. If I can't, we'll get back to you. I think I have a question. This is JJ. Hi. Hey, um, so I, so you mentioned sam.com, I mean, .gov, sorry. Mm -hmm. So do we have to have entity ID prior to applying for this grant? Um, you know, we are making it so that um, you don't have to have it to apply, but we would like you, if you don't have it, to show proof that you're going through the process. Perfect. Thank you. And, yeah. And the same thing with contracting. Um, we will um, require it prior to contracting, but if you're in the process, we haven't, since it was kind of a new process, um, this last, it's been a year now. Um, the website was kind of, or the identifying number process was a little behind and, and people were getting delayed. So we had a process for a waiver on that in extreme ex exceptions, but um, we'll work with you if that's the case. Thank you, Debbie. Mm -hmm. Trying to think of anything else. We contract with you. We try to get you paid. Um, if uh, we understand also that, you know, this is rent assistance. And so they're potentially, it's not huge amounts of funding, but it, it is, you know, putting um, potentially paying for rental assistance and, and arrears and things like that. And um, we, we understand there could be cash flow issues and we definitely want to work with the selected um, subcontractors to make sure um, they're comfortable with the getting paid because you will need to make the payment and then submit their request and get reimbursed. So you will be putting some money out there. 
and um, it takes a couple of weeks for the county to process um, the invoices. Um, so we will work with you. We really want to support all our agencies in order to operate these programs in an efficient way. So we know that it can be difficult um, with different organizations, depending on their cash flow situation. So uh, definitely um, we'll work one on one with our subcontractors to do the best we can. Um, unfortunately, we're not allowed. This funding source from the state does not allow us to do advances, so we cannot make payment um, without the services already being procured. So without um, staff time being billed already or um, you know, uh, you making a payment for a rent assistance or something like that. Any other kind of questions? Um, you know, uh, we're uh, the other thing just to note is, once we get closer to the awards and then contracting, we have the ability to backdate contracts. And so, you know, it, I know with new grants, it's a little tougher. A lot of organizations don't like to start until they have the ink on the paper. So that's totally fine. But we do usually have the ability to backdate. So, for instance, if we get through this process and we, you know, we think we're going to have an August one start date and we're kind of trying to figure things out. Um, we are able to backdate to August 1st, even if the contract doesn't get executed to like the 7th of August or something like that. So again, we will support um, uh, the award letter will indicate when you could start um, building against this grant and that if it's backdated, what it would be. So everyone's on the same page on that. Okay, and maybe um, Natasha, would you want to go over the timeline and then uh, maybe in, in that I think you'll go over what the next workshops are going to be. And so um, you can give them the topics. And so maybe if someone has questions, they can ask now or know that it's going to be covered later. Um, we're kind of doing this as a, a as a unique process. Um, we typically only have one um, pre-application workshop and we're doing a series of them this time. This is kind of the first since the application has been released, but we did one pre. Um, we're hoping that giving a little bit extra time in the application and having several workshops, we can get a lot of questions answered and, um, you know, hopefully um, encourage people to apply so there's not so many unknowns. And I do want to just double check. Uh, Mamadou, did you get your question answered? Um, I know I answered in the chat, but I just want to make sure that um, it was answered correctly. I think you were asking about um, uh, if the requirements were for just new contractors. Yes, it was answered, yes. Okay, wonderful. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so application timeline, uh, the application was released on Tuesday, and um, this is our first application workshop, like Debbie said. So today, we really wanted to just go over the county contracting requirements and reporting requirements and some other general information. We did have an information session. Um, the information session that happened before the application was released, gave a really kind of general outline of what services would qualify, um, what program expenses would qualify, and what the eligibility requirements were for um, any folks that you serve with this funding. And um, that Zoom uh, meeting was recorded and is available on the website. Um, the slides are also available there. And then we also have a Q&A document. And the Q&A document will be updated as we move forward in the process. Um, so this, um, this Zoom meeting is going to be recorded as well. And it will be um, up on the website in a couple business days or so, along with um, all the slides so that you can go back and you can uh, look at them and rewatch the recording if you need to. Um, you can also share it with other folks in your organization. And then the next workshop is going to be next Tuesday, uh, May 16th. And that is going to be focused mainly on the narrative portion of the application. 
So we'll go through the different questions and I can answer questions and clarify. Um, and then I can also kind of uh, explain the process of um, how to fill out the application just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, and then the final workshop will be um, on Tuesday, May 23rd. That one's going to focus mainly on the budget portion of the application. So we'll answer questions about that and kind of walk you through all the different pieces that are there. Um, and then Friday, June 2nd is our technical assistance deadline. So that means that before Friday, June 2nd, you can feel free to uh, email me questions. You can set up one-on-one -on -one conversations with me if you have any follow-up questions, but um, that's going to be the deadline for technical assistance. And then that following Tuesday, June 6th um, is the application deadline. So this application process, we're giving um, it four weeks from start to finish. And then following um, the application's the application deadline, um, we do a process um, where we have a project review committee, which is um, community members who come together and um, they score the applications and make recommendations for funding. Um, and so that will happen after that application deadline. It'll probably happen um, in late June. Um, and then uh, awards will be announced after that. And like Debbie said, we're we're hoping for an August 1st um, for our contract start date. Um, and we're gonna be working with um, folks who are awarded uh, in July and August to finalize contracts. Does anyone have any questions about the timeline or any questions? Um, at all uh, for the funding or the application, the application process. Oh, yes. hi, greetings, everyone. Hi. Hello. This is Ruby with my brother's keeper. I have a question. Is there going to be any emergency funding for like motel stays? things like that for individuals that might have housing readily available, but not available at that time? Yeah, the, um, the intention of these funds is really for prevention, not okay. um, homeless housing um, assistance. So um, that's not really the intent. Um, if first instance, someone was in housing and they were being evicted and we were trying to move them and like it was just this like little interim thing that potentially could be eligible in some limited circumstances but um the these funds are really um it's a it's an actual set aside within our grant from commerce to do um prevention so it's really people who have housing and um are going to, uh, this is from um, stop um, them becoming homeless. Um, so. Okay. Yep. Thank you. You answered my yeah. question. Yeah. So I see we also have a question in the chat about how much is the award typically? Um, and I can see I hid the slides, Debbie, but I wonder if they'll show up on the slideshow. Yeah, I don't know if they will. You could unhide it really quickly. I think, you know, just to click um, to say there's a couple things. Um, one is these are new funds. So there isn't a typical award. Um, what we've done is we have a set aside amount for this RFP. Um, it's 15% of our full grant amount is going just to um, buy and for organizations. We had a um, another RFP earlier this year. For a set aside um, for to select an agent, one agency, um, we were chose one agency to just do more general population prevention um, resources services, and also a provider to um, serve young adults. Um, and so, um, but with this funding, um, we are choosing to open it up and not 
um, not just choose one by and four to allow for um, potential multiple awards out of the funding. Um, Natasha, do you have off the top of your head, how much is it? Is it 1.5 million total or something like that? Uh, it's a little bit less than that, okay. but I can do the calculation in just Sorry a about second. That. No, so, no problem. Um, so we have a set aside for the whole pool of funds that are available in this RFP, but we don't, um, we're not really doing an, a typical. This slide that Natasha is sharing with you is just an example of kind of how we were doing the math just to, to, to show folks how you might break down an, an, a, a, a program. But um, by no means is this a uh, recommendation <laughs> to apply. Um, we were just kind of trying to think of like, oh, if, if, if it was a 12 month contract and, you know, you had an FTE, how much would that leave to do client assistance with? Is that enough to do some client assistance every month over 12 months and, and allow for some admin? And so you can see we did this at like 285,000. Um, how much is the total award again? One it's million? One million one hundred and forty-two thousand. Oh, okay, so I was off quite a bit, but anyways, uh, so that's it. Um, and the um, so that just so you know, the intent, our hope is, I don't know if that's the right word to use. Um, I want to be careful here, and I just because we, I would assume that we would fund more than one agency. I guess I should put it that way. Um, but we don't make the funding decisions. It's the project review committee, the PRC. But um, the PRC will be looking at the intent of these funds, reading the RF, they get the background same as you. And I would think it's highly unlikely. It's not, un, you know, it's not ruled out. There's no parameters on us from this, but that they would only fund like one agency for a million dollars. I think um, given the intent of these funds and to serve um, uh, the populations that the buy-in for organizations um, provide services to, it would be unusual, I bet, um, if we didn't fund um, more than one. That being said, I, I don't know, depending on the applications that come in, how many um, the PRC will choose to um, fund. Um, they always have the opportunity to not fully fund at the requested amount, so they could potentially um, uh, choose to fund maybe their several applications that scored really high and so they want to kind of divvy up the money or maybe they want to fully fund the highest one and the next they tear it down. They have that, that project review committee has the ability to determine um, the funding recommendations and they 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 give their recommendations and the reasons for it in a memo um, that is de um, then shared with our director and our director makes the fin final awards but um, they can put their proposal for the funding recommendations and they do it like, for instance, based on um, the applications, the strength of the applications, the scoring of the applications and the criteria and all the um, general requirements of the funding source. So it's really hard to tell um, how many we might be getting in and how many might be funded. Um, you know, we're excited about that possibility, but um, I, it's hard to tell. I, I think it would be unusual to, for someone perhaps to apply for the full amount. Let me put it that way. Are there any other questions? Oh. Th th thank you. That was my question about the um, about the award, typical award. Thank you. Uh, thank you for answering. You're so welcome. And I'm going to share my email in the chat. So if if you guys have any questions about the application, about the funding, feel free to send me an email. If you would like to set up time to have a one on one conversation about your project and whether or not the project that you are proposing would qualify for this funding, please reach out and let me know. Um, also, there's a lot of um, resources and information on the website. Uh, so definitely check out the website as well. Um, you can turn in the applications electronically. That's going to be the easiest way to do it, um, where you turn it in via email and all the instructions are on the application. Um, you can also turn in hard copies if that works better for you. Um, and I think that's about it. Anything else, Debbie? No, I was just... 
No, I think, um, you know, I can't really think of anything. I think that I just want to stress that like these are new funds for us, even though, like I said, um, we did an early RFP to select the general population and young adult providers um, provider. Um, we haven't had this funding pot ever before. So it's new to us. And so we appreciate all questions you have. And if we don't know the answer, we'll, we'll be happy to go to Commerce and ask them um, since they're the funder um, for us on this. And so there's no silly questions. Um, and we and also just give us a little grace because we may not know everything because we haven't done this yet. So um, we're really excited about it. And I'm sure we'll learn a lot um, together. Um, you know, we're excited that the um, there's also just to clarify, um, uh, there's a larger obvious, uh, um, there's less funding going to the young adult population, but the general population has a larger set aside. Um, there's no restrictions on who can access that. Um, and so um, our hope is that the grants we provide the buy-in for organizations will give them enough funding that if kind of paced out, you would have the program for a full year. Um, we don't expect getting additional money from the state, especially this first year. Um, they're tech, they're usually two year awards and it's usually the second year that sometimes other communities in our, in our state may not spend out. And if we're spending out, okay, we may be offered, but it's never a sure thing. So, um, there's no expectation that we would get additional funds. So we really hope that agencies kind of pace out this funding and are able to operate their program for a full year. And that being said, um, clients can also um, not duly, um, but they could, if, if there weren't funds in a certain organization funded, they could always go to the general population um, coordinate entry intake um, process and also uh, if they qualified receive funds. So some of these set asides aren't to restrict um, individuals on their own could also um, be served with the other pots, but um, the buy-in for organization is a special set aside that the state has requested. It, it doesn't um, require you to use coordinated entry for the referral process, which the general um, population and young adult populations are required to use um, coordinated entry um, for all referrals. So there's a little bit of flexibility with the buy-in for organizations and we're excited about that so that um, those organizations can really um, focus their services to the, the population and individuals they serve. I, I, I have a quick question here. Yes. Is it, I'm not trying to put the card before the horse or vice versa, but is it okay to start working on the application prior to the two upcoming uh, information yes. sessions? Just, uh, just, just to kind of look at it. Yes, yes, that's a great question. I didn't even think about that, but no, what a wonderful, we should have set you up to ask that one. Um, yeah, I'd highly recommend trying, uh, attempting to uh, start filling it out. Um, and then just kind of know that these work sessions are just additional technical assistance. We really want to start with this one in particular, because if there was anything like that was caused you pause or to um, second guess whether you wanted to even if you were award funds go under contract with the county, if you haven't um, contracted with the county for public funds, we wanted to be very transparent with you all our requirements. So that's why we started with that. But yes, in fact, I would recommend you start trying to fill out the application. Um, you know, we're not going to give really any like special tips. We're just going to be offering um, specific times to answer questions and kind of go through the application. So it's probably beneficial if you if you tried to do some of those sections um, before we even met. Um, you might have better questions then um, during the sessions, etc. But yes, there's no um, don't don't wait for us. Uh, thank thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, good question. And again, you can always reach out to Natasha one-on-one -on -one if, you know, you start working on something and you can't come to that session, you could just, um, you know, reach out to Natasha. Yes, I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah. All right. If there are no other questions for now, I'm going to stop the recording.